The Cosmic Companion digs into the inside story on planets with Sabina Stanley of Johns Hopkins University. Famed space reporter James G. Maynard sits at his desk, a twinkle in his eye, waiting for a break in his quest to get the inside story on planets. It was becoming clear he would need to get some leads for this story, but where? Hmm, it's becoming clear I'm going to need to get some leads for this story, but where? Hmm. Ah, yes, the MacGuffin case. All right, let's see what's in here, what's in here? Uh, well, Molinier. Um, I've got to remember to get that back to Thor at some point. And, and, and... Oh, the Holy Grail! That's where I put this! <sighs> and... Alas! Poor Yurik! I knew him, Horatio! Nope, not in here. If I'm going to get the inside story on planets, I'm going to have to talk with the planets themselves. And I'm certainly going to have to interview Sabina Stanley from Johns Hopkins University. She'll give us the inside scoop on planetary interiors. So, Mercury. You live closest to the sun, and you have a rocky surface, something like Earth's moon. We know that much. All right, Mercury, spill the beans. What's the lowdown on your core? Well, James, I'm small but mighty. I have a massive core that's mostly iron, see? Makes up 42% of my volume. That ain't no small potatoes like Earth having just 17%. Hey! It might be because of a massive impact event early in life, or maybe some wild times with the sun back in its younger, more active days. I'm not telling. Impressive. Now, Venus, you're sometimes called Earth's twin. But in some ways, people who say that are just whistling Dixie, aren't they? I may have a core, mantle, and crust much like Earth, but my surface is hotter than a $2 pistol. I don't have any plate tectonics like Earth, and my atmosphere. It's so dense, it's like being 900 meters underwater on Earth. I'm not giving up my secrets anytime soon. Always a hot time talking with you, Venus. Uh, Earth, uh, people know you well, but remind us again about your layers. Of course, James. From the inside out, I have an inner core, an outer core, mantle, and crust. My inner core is solid iron and nickel, while my outer core is molten. This creates my magnetic field, nurturing life on my surface, protecting every being as best I can. Not like some planets whose names I won't mention. Mars! You're next. What's your story, morning glory? I have a similar structure to Earth and Venus, but my core is cooler and far less active. I have more iron in my mantle than Earth, giving me my distinctive reddish hue, as well as having more sulfur in my core than Earth. At least I have oceans, dearie. I've got some big volcanoes, though, thanks to my thick, viscous mantle. I haven't let loose with an eruption since you humans have been watching, but that doesn't mean that I won't do so someday. Never change, Mars. Never change. Miss Landers, what's buzzing, cousin? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, all right, I understand. Thank you. Well, hot diggity dog. It appears Sabina Stanley from Johns Hopkins University is here. Uh, this could be our big break on getting the inside story on planets. When we get back, we're going to be... To getting the straight talk from the largest planets in our solar system. Join us for an interstellar joyride through the cosmos with the Cosmic Companion. Every week, 
our intrepid host, James G. Maynard, dives headfirst into the wildest corners of science, comedy, pop culture, and history. The Cosmic Companion takes you on a roller coaster of knowledge with entertaining dives into fascinating subjects. James is like your science-obsessed buddy who's always ready with a fun fact at a party. Oh, and what's yeah. a cosmic journey without some quality company? James rubs shoulders, figuratively of course, with the creme de la creme of the scientific world. We're talking brainiacs who decipher the laws of the universe, authors who craft stories that warp space and time, and developers who are building the future. Our cosmic guest list? Oh, it's star-studded. We've had the likes of Neil deGrasse Tyson, dinosaur expert Steve Brusati from Jurassic World, the legendary ocean explorer Sylvia Earle, a myriad of astronauts, actors, and a constellation of other awe-inspiring guests. But wait, there's more. The Cosmic Companion isn't just any show, we've got AI on our side. Hello. I am AI. Hmm. Did you know that is a palindrome? We're talking mind-bending visuals, snazzy animations, original music, and soundscapes that'll make your eardrums do the moonwalk. Are you ready to embark on this epic journey? Head over to thecosmiccompanion.net and get ready to laugh, learn, and explore the mysteries of the universe. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are delighted to be joined once again by Dr. Sabina Stanley. She is a physicist and planetary scientist at Johns Hopkins University, and she's recently released a new book, What's Hidden Inside Planets. So let's get the inside story on planets. Welcome back to the show, Sabina. Thank you so much. Very glad to be here. Great, great. So let's begin the interview where you began the book, right here on Earth. Um, can you tell us a little bit about all the mysterious cool stuff that's happening under our feet? Yeah, great question. So I think it's hard for people to realize how much interesting stuff is happening below our feet. We're so used to experiencing everything on the surface, right? And we know about some of that cool stuff. We know about earthquakes and volcanoes and the fact that we have a lovely atmosphere and the temperature is kind of nice here. But all of that is really just the manifestation of processes that are happening deep inside our planet. So I wanted in the book, What's Hidden Inside Planets, is to really tell people how is stuff happening inside affecting what we see on the outside? So we talk about things like how the core of the earth made of molten iron generates a magnetic field that protects the planet from harmful radiation from the sun. We talk about how convection in the mantle of the earth results in plate tectonics on the surface, which is responsible for things like earthquakes and a lot of the volcanism on the surface of the earth. We talk about how diamonds are created deep in the interior, all sorts of fun stuff like that. Mm. And a lot of that actually even goes into producing the conditions we need for this crazy thing we call life, don't they? Absolutely, yep. Yeah. yeah, can you go into like some of the ways like say volcanoes contribute mm -hmm. towards making sure. life possible here? Sure, I mean, I think one of the most straightforward ways is that the reason we have an atmosphere right now is that it's essentially been outgassed from the center of the planet. So many of the volatiles that we have, even the water that we have in our oceans, those all come from the deep interior of the earth when mantle convection has caused um, volcanism and other ways for materials to get to the surface and then kind of evaporate into our and form an atmosphere and then form oceans as well. So that's probably the most obvious way. There's also all sorts of nutrients that get cycled through the earth. The carbon cycle happens on the earth. There's uh, we're kind of familiar with the stuff that happens near the surface in the carbon cycle where carbon dioxide is produced and then it gets the carbon gets kind of filtered through the ocean systems and life to make carbonates and those go into rocks. But then those rocks at the bottom of the ocean floor go back into the planet. Uh, and so there's an entire cycle involved there. So nutrients, basics like the importance of liquid water. The fact that we have solid surfaces like rocks, all of those things are kind of, we believe to be important for life to form as we know it. Hmm. And how do we know what's, what's happening even on our own planet before we take off elsewhere? Yeah, so this, tools, yeah. 
Yeah, great question. So this is the frustrating thing, right? We would love to be able to, you know, like in my favorite movie, The Core, be able to descend into the deep interior of the planet and see all these wonderful processes, but that's just not possible. So we have to be a little bit sneaky. We're kind of, we kind of do the same sort of things that your doctor might do to try to um, figure out what's wrong with you, right? Rather than completely cutting you open and looking for stuff, they do, they do tests. They use x-rays, CAT scans, MRIs, they're kind of equivalents of those for studying the deep interior of the Earth. So for example, um, we can use the Earth's gravity field. Now we're used to thinking of gravity on Earth as being about 9.8 meters per second squared, right? But gravity varies as you walk on the surface of the Earth. The actual gravitational acceleration you feel depends on how much mass there is directly below you. So little differences in mass below you can produce differences in the gravitational acceleration at the surface. Now they're tiny, you won't notice them, but we can measure these differences and then we can use them to infer what's going on deep inside planets. There's also magnetic fields. We can measure magnetic fields at the surface that are produced in the deep core. So a lot of what we know about the iron core inside Earth comes from our understanding of, and, and our measuring of the magnetic fields we see above the surface. So interesting. And of course, dealing with trying to figure out the interiors of planets, even our in our own solar system, mm -hmm. is a whole different kettle of fish, isn't it? Yeah, it's, <laughs> you know, everything gets harder when you don't have as much access to the place, right? So the right. most we, we've learned from other planets, we send missions, planetary spacecraft to these other planets, and they use, once they get there, they use quite similar tools to study the planets, right? So we can do magnetic studies of other planets. We can do gravitational studies of other planets. The kind of holy grail that we're really interested in that can give us a lot of information is seismic studies of other planets. And on Earth, we use seismology, the waves that travel through the Earth from earthquakes to figure out different layers inside the Earth, what it's made of. We can also do that on the moon. And because of the Mars InSight mission that was on Mars, uh, we were actually able to find uh, out information about the interior of Mars by studying Mars quakes there. So that's what we would really love to do the most for a lot of the planets. You can get the most information from that. Hmm. And naturally, um, I would think the uh, interiors of each of the planets in our solar system are, are they're quite a diverse lot. But what planet in our, in our family of planets interests you the most and why? Oh gosh, that's a hard one. I always tell people that my, you know, I, I say my favorite planet is X, but the X changes depending on who I'm talking to. Uh, Great answer. So right now, I think my favorite planets are the ice giants. So I'm talking about Uranus and Neptune. They're sort of the farthest planets in our solar system. And they're mostly made of water and other, what we call ices, ammonia and methane. And we just, we have, know so little about them. And we've had one great mission, Voyager 2, that uh, flew by both planets in the early 80s. And we got some amazing data from that. But we need to go back there and study them more deeply, mainly because uh, we know there are a whole lot of them out there around other stars. So there are a lot of exoplanets that look a lot like Uranus and Neptune. So maybe we should learn a little bit about what they're like in our own solar system. Mm -hmm. And before we get to exoplanets, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Venus is uh, quite the troublemaker, isn't it? Venus is, now, I love Venus, but Venus is my least favorite planet when it comes to trying to use it to, to learn about it, right? So all right, of the right. techniques that we would normally use to study the interior of a planet are really hard at Venus for a variety of different reasons, right? It's not even the same reason. So I'll give you a quick example. Yeah. Uh, we can actually use the rotation of a planet and the shape that the planet gets from that rotation to learn about the interior structure of a planet. Venus rotates so slowly that its shape doesn't change very much. Mm -hmm. And its axis that it rotates about doesn't vary a lot from the actual axis that the Venus rotates around the sun. So we also can't use that information. It's very frustrating. Venus is just a very frustrating planet. Mm. And... As we look out, there was quite a couple of minutes ago, I think it was up to 5,400 exoplanets found. Uh, tell us about some of the really cool hot spots out there. 
Yeah, you know, the amazing thing about exoplanets, these planets around other stars, is that everything we thought was normal about planets that we learned from our, older, our own solar system mm -hmm. is just completely changed when you look at exoplanets. We don't know what's normal anymore, right? So it, out there, we find these super Earth planets. So imagine something that's a rocky planet like Earth, but 10 times as massive, right? And that completely changes the behavior of the planet's interior and what the surface might be like. You can have planets out there that are incredibly hot because they're really close to their parent stars, so mm -hmm. hot that their surfaces are completely molten. So imagine magma planets. Uh, some of these planets can have incredibly fast winds zipping things, zipping like material from the near side to the far side of the planet. There are exoplanets out there that have uh, rain being made of metals, so metallic rain happening uh, on the surface. So it's just, there's a lot of really cool stuff out there when you start to kind of see what happens when you take a planet and you put it in a slightly different condition, give it a little more temperature, like a little higher temperature, make it a little bigger, uh, give it a bit more of some element. So it's really interesting to see all these differences that can be produced. Hmm. And even the most so-called habitable planets that we know of uh, are no are really no place for a vacation are they not that we found yet right i like to tell people there really is no earth 2.0 earth is incredibly unique as we know it and we have yet to find another object out there that has the conditions on the surface that are so nice and comfy for vacationing as we like to do here um, so I think it's really important to understand how important it is to take care of our home planet and make sure that it continues to be the lovely habitable place that it is today. Hmm. And um, now, as I, as far as I understand, the deepest hole yet drilled in Earth is the Cola Super Deep borehole. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you might have learned from that and whether you think we'll ever go any deeper? Yeah, great question. So there was a big move um, started sort of in the 1960s to really try and dig down to the next layer inside the earth. So we're on the crust, below the crust, you have the mantle. And so the question was, could we reach the mantle, right? And it's really hard to do so. Now the Kola super deep borehole uh, actually decided to go through a huge craton. So a big uh, piece of crust. So it didn't actually reach the mantle, but going through old crust, as you go deeper in the crust, it gets older and older. You can actually learn a lot about the history of the crust and the history of the planet. So they've learned a lot about plate tectonics, about what the crust is made of um, and, and things like that. So it's still an incredibly important thing, but we have yet to reach the mantle uh, by drilling into the earth. I think it's just incredibly hard to do. And nowadays we are learning about different ways to study that region without actually drilling down there. My mm -hmm. favorite method to kind of uh, to kind of get a sense of what's happening deep down is sometimes the interior brings samples up to the surface for us. So we don't have to drill down and get them. Uh, diamonds, for example, are actually formed deeper in the earth and then come up to the surface through tectonic processes later on. And recently they've found diamonds that have what are called inclusions. So when we when we think of diamonds in jewelry, we don't want them to have any kind of inclusions. We want them as pure as possible. But for geologists, we want our diamonds to have these little inclusions, these other elements stuck in them. And sometimes these diamonds bring up things like actual water that's been trapped in the diamond from deep inside the earth. And so we can actually learn about what the materials are down there because they're brought up to the surface in this little holding capsule in these diamonds. So interesting. Mm -hmm. And finally, what is it that got you interested in planetary science and what do you, what what makes the field so cool? Yeah, this so I should start by saying that I actually grew up in an impact crater in northern Canada. So oh. the the town where I grew up, Sudbury, Ontario, Canada, uh yeah. was formed because a giant meteor hit the surface about 1.8 billion years ago creating a giant hole that brought up a bunch of materials from the deeper part uh, and created essentially a, a, a bunch of natural resources, mineral resources that are mined for today. So I even grew up in sort of the perfect place to think about planetary interiors. I didn't really know much of that growing up. So it's interesting now to realize how, how rich of an area that I, I grew up in should have influenced my life when I didn't know about it at the time. 
But for me, it was really about loving exploration and loving uh, science. I was, I, I got to say, I was a huge Star Trek Next Generation fan. And the idea of being able to, there we go, the idea of being able to go out there and explore other worlds, that that's really what motivated me when I was young. As I got older and older, it was more kind of loving the science behind it, loving the possibilities, um, loving the work. Hmm. That is so incredible. Well, thanks so much for being on the show again, Sabina. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. This was wonderful. Thanks so much. Thanks. And that was Sabina Stanley, planetary scientist at Johns Hopkins University. Check out her new book, What's Hidden Inside Planets? All right, Jupiter, you're the big cheese around here. What's your secret? Well, James, I'm a real gas, see? Hydrogen and helium with a core of rock and metal. I've got the largest ocean in the solar system made of pure hydrogen. And my core? Could be metallic hydrogen, could be a super dense hydrogen and silica soup. Who's to say? You're a killer diller, Jupiter. Now, Saturn, you're all dolled up with those rings. But what's the story with the interior? Like Jupiter, I don't have a definite crunchy center here. I'm not a candy bar. I've got a core that's got some give, maybe some metallic hydrogen. Surround that with some liquid hydrogen and helium and a coating of gases, including ammonia. Ah, that's the ammonia smell. That someone was cleaning windows around here. Smells like a cat box to me. Really? Uranus, you're a nice giant. What does that mean for your interior? My interior is made of ices like water, methane, and ammonia around a small rocky core. And I'm unique because I rotate on my side. You other planets don't know what you're missing. We. Oui. Thanks, Uranus. You're a real ducky shin cracker. And, uh, Sorry about people making fun of your name. Whatever. Uh, Neptune, you're a no-nonsense eager beaver running a real marathon around the sun. What's going on inside your world? Like Uranus, I'm an ice giant, but my core is larger and my atmosphere has more methane, giving me my deep blue color. My winds can blow over 2,000 kilometers an hour. Those winds are the real McCoy five times faster than the fastest winds recorded on Earth. Seriously? Again? You're all just jealous. And finally, Pluto. Now, you know, you're no longer classified as a planet, but we all still love you. What's your interior like? It's a bum rap, but it's fine. I don't need outside redemption by humans. I'm a complex world with a rocky core surrounded by ice and water. My surface is almost pure frozen nitrogen with mountains of water ice. And I have a heart-shaped glacier. Who needs to be labeled a planet when you have a heart? Eat that, Tin Man. Well said, Pluto. Thanks to all of our planetary pals for stopping in and giving us their inside story. Join us next week on the Cosmic Companion where we make science videos that are really the cat's pajamas. Aww. And don't be a wet blanket. Subscribe, follow, share, do all that good stuff. And jeepers, creepers, keep your peepers peeled for our season finale. Coming up on the 16th of December, clear skies.